Our next speaker will be uh, Amilcare Porato. Um, he's at Princeton University and will be talking about the practical importance of theory and landscape evolution model modeling. So we're scaling a bit back to like terrestrial and longer time scales is what I'm hoping. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for, for inviting me. Okay, good. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna show a little bit of equations they, with, with the fog outside. I think it will be perfect. <laughs> See you in 15 minutes, okay? Uh, but, but we're all fascinated. I don't know if I have a nice picture, but you can lower a little bit the light maybe on this side. Um, we are all fascinated by these landscapes. Uh, hierarchy of valleys and ridges, uh, uh, this is the quintessential geomorphology, uh, this, this self-similarity that we have, whereby we cannot even tell whether this is the Himalayas, the Andes, or indeed it is South Carolina, the foothills of, of the Appalachian, where I did some work with, with great colleagues at the CZO, Critical Zone Observatory, uh, at the Calhoun. And, and what are we going to... So we, we all know that... Um, when you have topography, lots of things change. I'm a eco-hydrologist, so I'm interested in vegetation, soil processes, and, and we know that if, if we change curvature and slopes, lots of interesting things happen. If we look at the main cycles of water, energy, carbon, soil partitioning, all of this partitioning, which is really what we do in hydrology, in biogeochemistry, see where things go and how they uh, change from rainfall to evapotranspiration to uh, erosion, weather, and denudation, sensible heat, all of these are impacted by that. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. What I'm going to do is, I wanted to model, we wanted to model uh, the basic transformation of this landscape, capture this hierarchy of valleys and ridges. And so we, we looked at the minimalist uh, possible model that would capture that. Uh, the model that has all the, all the information, and if I take some out, it actually doesn't give me any more the branches. So we started from what we see in the literature. Many people have used that, uh, including myself here, Greg, uh, uh, even earlier, of course. Uh, and, and you see this type of model in, uh, in the literature where you have uh, a differential equation for the elevation z, I'm sure you've seen, many of you have seen this equation, you have a diffusion, Laplacian of, of z, which we attribute to some processes, soil creep, and so on. Uh, this will just be, all of these will be constant, as simple as possible. I want to see what are the engines of this that drive this instability. Uh, tectonic uplift will be also a constant, and then the fluvial erosion term, very interesting nonlinear term where you have uh, uh, the gradient of the slope of your landscape that multiplies this A, which is an interesting quantity of which we'll talk about, uh, which is the contributing area. So this is a nonlinear term. Some people have called this an advection diffusion equation. It is not an advection diffusion equation. This is not advection. There is a, there is a, a gradient, but it has absolute value, and also there is this strange variable here. It's, a, it's an area, it's a contributing area. What is that? You take a point, and you see what all the area that contribute to that point. So it's L squared. I'll do a little bit of dimensional analysis later on. So you wonder, this equation is not complete by itself, right? So this is a variable. It changes as the landscape evolves. What, what happens to this capital A? And there is something strange, uh, we thought, on this capital A. We, you rarely find global quantities if you take Navier-Stokes equation, Euler equation, you never see directly there the volume of, of the fluid or, or the total. So, so we, we thought about it. It's something. And one thing that, that, that we realized in, in this paper is uh, 
We call it capital A because we have in mind most often, and this is a classic paper, uh, Gary Wilbus and, 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 co and collaborators, but we did the same and many others did the same. It's because we have in mind a discretized domain. And then you have pixels here, and each pixel, pixel has a finite area, and you are at the point that you, if you calculate a, an area, an L square actual area. But when you have a PDE, a partial differential equation, you tip, and especially with diffusion, you typically don't develop this type of singularity. You have a smooth field. And one of the questions is whether the, that singularity actually may or may not happen. Uh, but, but if you have a smooth field, actually each point doesn't have a contributing area. The contributing area of each point is zero only if you develop singularity like a cusp, something that has a, 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 a continuous first derivative, you do have finite contributing area. So, so what's going on with that? And that's why I put theory in the title, just to make it sound a little bit more, more fancy. But what, what Sara Bonetti, a, a former a student in my group, a, a, and, and my group did is actually look at a little bit more seriously at the point when you write this PDE, what happens. And what you have in a landscape, you do have a contributing area, which would be this green area projected on the, on the horizontal. If you take a contour line, if you take a finite width, and, and this is the contributing area to a point. You have a convex bound surface. But what you actually need to have in the equation is the specific contributing area, which is actually a length, which is the limit of capital A over this with W as you take the limit of W going to zero. That, that's, that's, we, we did, it took a while to convince ourselves that that was the right way, and I'm not going to go into the detail in these 15 minutes, but that's what we basically did. And so we were able to write the minimalist equation now in complete form so that you can do a little bit more of, of theory if you have the whole thing. And then you have the Z equation that I showed you now with the little a. I think has changed, but I just call it little a. But, but it's a conceptually different thing because now you can write down the equation for that little a, which is a a conservation equation for those of you who, who you can see that is, is the divergence of, of a flux equal to one, which is basically, let me just put everything here, a geometrization of, of the water flow equation that actually carves the surface. So if you want to convince yourself briefly, you can think of now on top of the Z surface there being a, an H height of water flowing because of a certain rainfall and this is the divergence of the flux of water on the surface and if you take the velocity of this flux constant and you route it through the steepest descent and you take rainfall unitary so you rescale it and you take constant rainfall with lots of simplifications here and you take that steady state which is okay because it's a, the, the water evolves faster compared to way the surface evolves, you do get that equation. So, so now we have a complete system that can be studied analytically, it can be studied numerically. Shashank, my former student, is a good numerical guy, uh, let's say excellent, and he came up with this uh, a code that, that does very fast and, and reliable simulations. We could actually have some analytical solution, at least without channels, we could check the uh, accuracy of our simulation and you can see with some value of some parameter I'll tell you in a moment, you get nice valleys and and so on. And you see this doesn't look like a real, it looks like a slice of a cake, more than a real landscape. Apologies, but what we really wanted to do here is to simplify our domain. There is it's a slab of infinite that I'll do in a moment is infinite length with a finite width so that we can take away all the complexity of the boundary condition and just focus on what actually happens. So we will just cut away this part and, and, and analyze this part. And you saw that as the geomorphology, in, the simplified geomorphology is evolving, you could see the evolution of the valleys and the two time scales that we have and how these things evolved. Now this is a complex, there is nothing random in our simulation other than numerical probably 
errors and the initialization of slightly random. But the, this is the complexity, the instability inside the, the due to the nonlinear term, the coupling of the two equations that, that generates all of this. And when you have this type of equations, it's a little bit like analyzing turbulence. Numerical simulations are useful, but how do you organize them? And so what we decided to do is to apply dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is based on uh, the homogeneity principle, which these guys in Yukuyama don't really like, apparently, no? But it actually tells us that we cannot put together things that don't have the same dimension, and actually you can do a little bit more sophistication than this in, in our solution. So, so just to give you a sense of what we have done, uh, we take, for example, the sediment budget over, over this slab that we simulate. So you integrate these guys over an area, you can integrate this, it, 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 it's not complicated, you get the length of the contour, V is the constant that goes out, and this is the average slope at the boundary, the average slope of your, of your landscape. So this is actually the complex part, and this is the simulation, it's, it's really messy, how can I get the integral? Let, let's just call this uh, something, and we'll treat it with dimension. And then this is constant, this that's the uplift times the air. So this is a theoretical sediment budget over your, over our domain. We, so, so what we have here is a, an equation for S star, which we really don't know, but dimensional analysis tells us, look, it's a function of, yes, D, U, L, which is the, the uh, distance between the two. This will, will, will change the complexity of our system. K, which is the erosion factor, and N and M, are the nonlinear exponents. I'll fix them according to the literature and not talk about that much. But then we can we can have a we can treat this with the famous pi theorem. I hope you're familiar with that. If you're not, I have a couple of references in the next slide. It's really a powerful technique that that we working in this type of field should should apply as much as possible because it's, uh, uh, it helps us put together order in, in, in the messy world that we have around us with, with all of this complexity. And, and it tells us, the Pi theorem, that out of this you can actually rewrite this equation as a non-dimensional form which instead of being living in a six-dimensional space, which is a very big space, it lives in a three-dimensional space. Actually, if you fix this, it lives in a one-dimensional space where the only variable is this channelization index that contains the two quantities of Bowen theory, okay? So this is like a Reynolds number of our equation. If you're familiar with fluid mechanics, Reynolds number is a way of telling us how complex the flow is when it switches from laminar to turbulent and from laminar to turbulent. I'm going a little bit fast because I don't have much time, but Shashank went wild in these in this simulations. Each point is a long-term steady state simulation of this, uh, what happens in the slab, changing the parameters, all organized according to the channelization index. Small here, high here, basically here is light, strong erosion and high diffusion. So you go from one to the other, and here are different values of the exponent 10, and I think all of this is n equal to 10. And what you can see is actually quite interesting. You see that there is a domain here where everything is dominated by diffusion. There are no channels. And uh, And so no channels, something that looks like this. As you get into a transition phase, you start having the first channels, but, but not very complex uh, topography. But there is a very interesting regime here where actually the, curve, the, the, the curves become flat, meaning that the normalized budget, uh, sediment budget doesn't even depend anymore on the, on the channelization index. If you're familiar with, with the Moody diagrams, pipe flow, that's exactly what happens in turbulence. The turbulence is strong enough that now the cascade of vortices has created friction in a way that is independent of the Reynolds number. You are in a regime in which calculation here or here doesn't matter, you can actually use the scaling of dimension analysis and you save lots of calculation. And uh, that's the, the regime dominated by fluvial erosion. These are the simulations, just to give you a sense. If you're here, 
completely dominated by diffusion, you can actually get an analytical solution. You can check your, your results here. Transition, the one that I showed you before. And here, D and E are basically in the self-similar regime. The self-similar regime means that now the parameter is gone, dimension, this group is gone, and, and everything looks like a complete stretch. Only here, not everywhere. If you stretch your simulation, it's indistinguishable. And this is why you cannot distinguish South Carolina from Himalayas, from the Andes, and so next time you want to go to Himalayas, just go to South Carolina. That's it. <laughs> You save money and it's, it's nice. So, okay, just, uh, the, I've lost track of time. I, it's, okay, okay, good. So then I skip this because, because I don't have time. And this, okay. And I just want to show you a couple of things, uh, and, and, then, and then if, if you're interested, I, I, there are lots of interesting things behind these equations that we've discovered. So this is an analysis, again, by Shashank, where we took a piece of the landscape in, of South Carolina, and we studied it this way, and we analyzed the contributing areas, so these are the rivers, and these are the valleys, and then we turned it upside down, now the valleys become ridges, the ridges become valid, there is nice duality between the two networks, and you can find the point at which the, the two contributing areas are the same, and they become the ridges as if you were draining in two dimensions. And what you have here is actually the prototype of a supply drainage network. Supply from the ridges and draining from the valleys, which is something that gave him the idea of, of now applying this for, for networks that we find in, uh, in biology or, or, or in engineering, in which, for example, you supply uh, uh, blood with oxygen through the arteries and you drain it through the veins, and, and the ridges and the valleys become the, the two types of, of networks. So there is nothing, and I conclude with this, there is nothing in this equation that tells you that this should be applied to, to two dimensions. These are operators that are valid in any dimension if you write them this way. And so what about if you think of this in 3D, and uh, this then become not a contributing area, but a contributing volume. Z is not elevation, but becomes like a density of a field. And, and, and of course the flow is now a flow in 3D, and, and you get nice simulation of, of now not, uh, not valleys and ridges, but channels that, that have the same hierarchical structure. Much harder in 3D because two dimensionality uh, gets, gets more problematic. But, but yeah. So I'll, I'll close here and uh, uh, sorry for rushing you through. Uh, thank you. That was. That was very interesting. Uh, of course, I really enjoyed the <laughs> turbulence, the fluid mechanic uh, visualization of all of those kind of problems. I'm not sure I got your A calculation, but I get that this is sort of water flux um, mass conservation better and all there. Um, now, something that, that if you go back to your sort of phase diagram or regime diagram there, Yes, this one. Why are I'm not, and I try to remember what is in the I parameter, but um, uh, something that puzzles me is there is that now if you take real time or dimensionless time the way you want, uh, over a year you have some flooding, etc. So, it's sort of practically, and you go to a practical reason, you have potentially, or I think actually, huge fluctuation that will make you alternate from like when it rains a lot versus like when there's a lot of water in the system versus not like so how can this model sort of yes. go to a thing about that do you have that's a, that's a really good question. so these are I, I wrote it and i don't think i said it these are long this equation turned out to have an attractor that is a steady state so you, you 
end up at the same solution. I think we don't because we don't have too many channels and at the end we may cause uh, uh, some problems. But these are steady state solution at the end with, with this constant rain and constant uplift. Uh, uh, so there is nothing of importance for us to do. Now we know in reality maybe this carving of these valleys happens in intense events. So ours is basically a a long-term link field approach to, to all of this. Now, I don't, because of the separation of scales between the water equation and, and the sediment part, the three equations, um, I don't think it's that crucial to actually capture the intermittency of, of the water path. Uh, clearly, it's just a very punctuated type of dynamics which happens when you have strong events and nothing when when, when very little, when, when you have normal conditions, but uh, I don't think it's going to change qualitatively the, the result. Quot quantitatively, yes, and it would definitely be interesting to... And I because so what's in your I channelization index? I, I think I follow you, but this because what is in ID or CI, is, uh, but we can talk this more was, later. This was just the, uh, the, the dimensionless group given by quantities that are fixed. So this is a, a number, like 500 in my solution, um, it's like a Reynolds number for a fact. Mm -hmm. Diameter, viscosity, density, so not something that depends on time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll try and be fast. Um, so I was very interested in the 3D application at the end of your talk. Um, the biological implications there, is there any research done into root development and modeling of root structures? Very good question. There are lots of root, 3D root models. They're more like branch tree, branching type of models. I don't know if this type of approach has been, has been used. I, actually, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I think it's more like in the formation of uh, uh, veins and, and lungs in biology, but yes, and also the tree structure would be very interesting to see if the trees at some point uh, have the same statistics as the ones that we have. Yeah, we, we should do it. Thank you.